Hi, my name is Jamie Saxon. I'm a postdoc with Nick Beamster at the University of Chicago. Our paper is GPS-based geolocation of consumer IP addresses. I want to start with the question that motivated this project, which was how can we build accurate, granular maps of internet access? This question was urgent when we began to think about it, but it has really reached a fever pitch in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, as schools, businesses, and academic conferences have all gone online. Of course, we're not the first to think about maps, and we could lean on survey data or administrative records for figures on subscriptions or ISP offerings. But what about realized access to the internet, actual site visits? Our first idea was what about server logs for a no-frills, high-volume site like Wikipedia? Could that tell us who's online? Now, I would like to map access to people here in the city of Chicago. So can we map IP addresses to demographic groups? More to the point, are IP geolocation databases accurate at the neighborhood level? Past academic work has developed geolocation methods and evaluated the performance of commercial databases, although often with much smaller samples than we'll use here for known locations, or they've been limited to cons comparing the consistency between databases. Past work has also tended to focus on academic web networks, which we found to be easy targets, since they are big fixed line networks with well-known locations. In this paper, we use GPS data from consumer smartphones to evaluate IP geolocation accuracy. We worked to understand heterogeneity in this accuracy between network contexts, and we evaluated whether geolocation database accuracy suffices for research on internet access by human populations. Let's talk about the data, which were generously provided by Unicast. Each line of data consists of a device ID, a unique identifier, a timestamp, a cluster type that categorizes a cluster, a duration of a location, and a GPS-based latitude and longitude all along with the IP address. We had data for three cities in the United States, New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia for three months of 2020. Ultimately, we had 248 million simultaneous reports of GPS location and IP address. Using the time and cluster duration, we constructed an indicator for devices at night, which is useful as a proxy for home locations. And we merged the GPS uh, base location to neighborhoods or census tracts using a spatial join to figure out neighborhood demographics. Next, we used WHOIS to determine IP addresses, ISPs, by their doing business as name. As we do this, we distinguish mobile from fixed line offerings for providers like Verizon and AT&T. Next come the IP geolocation databases, MaxMine IP to location. We used both the free and paid versions and we aligned our vintages with location data. Then we did the IP to location lookup. Finally, we calculate the Vincenti distance between the locations reported by the GPS and by the database. This distance is our primary parameter of interest, and we will call it the geolocation error in what follows. So how accurate are the databases? Here I'm showing quantiles of geolocation error by city, database, and subscription type, whether free or paid. First finding, MaxMine outperforms IP to location in each of the three cities. The geolocation's errors are smaller at each of the quantiles for either of the services. Next, comparing the paid and free databases, the paid databases do perform better, their errors are smaller, but only marginally so. Finally, we were encouraged by the performance of the geolocation databases in certain contexts. The median error on MaxMind's paid database, for instance, in New York City, was just 2.6 kilometers on these fixed line data. That struck us as pretty good. Still, we would encourage caution in generalizing from our three cities to other geographies. Next, we wanted to break down heterogeneity in geolocation performance by ISP. 
Here, we're showing the CDF of geolocation error, again, by city and database. Fixed line ISPs are shown with solid lines and mobile ISPs are shown dashed. It's clear that the accuracy of geolocation databases is totally different for fixed line and mobile IP addresses. Geolocation errors are far higher, further to the right, on mobile than fixed line networks. This may seem obvious now that you know the answer. Mobile ISPs use carrier grade NATs, so they're using even individual IP addresses over and over again for many users. But I think we've still learned something. They could have configured this to send all of the data for a single cell or city block through one IP address. They don't do that. Further, there are big differences in performance even within the fixed line ISPs like Comcast, shown here as the black lines, and we wanted to pull this apart yet further. Why are some addresses located more accurately than others? We know that it must be possible to tease this apart because MaxMind does it. They offer us an estimate of the accuracy of reports, which is shown here, and they get this right. The more accurate bins are have lower errors than the less accurate bins. So how are the accurate addresses different? Our hypothesis was that the slash 24 subnets that are physically spread out cannot be accurately geolocated. Doing so would require finer address level data. By contrast, slash 24s that were spatially concentrated would be located accurately. To evaluate this, we need a spatial scale. We define this as a convex hull encompassing a config configurable share of the sub subnet's location reports, those that were closest to the center of the cluster. There was a good deal of variation in this scale. The subnet on the right is shown with the spatial scale zoomed out by a factor of eight. And indeed, we find that the spatially concentrated slash 24s are accurately located, whereas dispersed ones have larger errors. Incidentally, if we were to do this for the mobile ISPs, we saw that each slash 24 was used over basically the entire urban area. But still, we haven't really answered the question, we've just postponed it. Why do certain groups of addresses on fixed line networks have large spatial scales? In the paper, we show that users return repeatedly to addresses on spatially concentrated slash 24s, whereas they tend to hit addresses from spatially dispersed ones just once those addresses appear to be used ephemerally. This behavior shows up on several, although not all, ISPs. At this point, I want to return to the demographic question that originally motivated our work. We concluded that IP geolocation cannot associate addresses with human demographics accurately enough for social research. There are several reasons for this. First, Devices connecting through mobile networks are not accurately geolocated. But we can't just drop mobile traffic. Poor populations are less likely to have both fixed line and mobile connections. We know this both from the census and from the share of data at night that originates on mobile versus fixed line networks. In poorer areas, the share of clusters that are on mobile networks is higher, lighter colors. In wealthier areas, the share is lower, darker colors. Focusing on fixed line connections would disproportionately drop traffic by poorer populations and bias reports of how much different demographic groups are showing up in the server logs. If we were to persist nevertheless and focus on fixed line data, the geolocation databases are still not really reliable enough. Using them will, in general, result in attenuation bias for any estimates. That brings us to the end. We've just shown that MaxMind outperforms IP to location and that the improved accuracy from paid versions is quite modest in the cities that we studied. We observed and decomposed heterogeneity in geolocation accuracy of slash 24 subnets. It arises from different spatial scales and different network uses. And we concluded that database accuracy does not currently suffice for social science research. This paper has a number of bonus findings that would invite you to check out. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. And please also feel free to connect at the emails given.